welcome. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, we do rejoice and are glad in this day that you have made the beauty of this day and the beauty of what we are celebrating here. God, we thank you um, for this opportunity to celebrate your faithfulness to Jeff and to La Cunada Presbyterian Church as you have called Jeff to serve as their senior pastor. Come Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this time of celebration and dedication. We ask your blessing on this service of worship. May we be reminded of your love for us, your faithfulness, and the call that you have placed on all of our lives. Bless Jeff and his ministry. Bless La Cunada Presbyterian Church and this new season of their church life. God, we love you and welcome you here today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm Mark Eschoff and I hail from the church where Jeff received his first call. And as a result, I'd love to share with you about 45 minutes of stories that you'd love to hear, but I'm not gonna do that. I am gonna invite you to stand and join me in this affirmation uh, from the prophet Isaiah. Please join me. A voice says, cry out. And I say, what shall I cry? Men and women are like grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Let's join in singing. You're the God of this city. You're the King of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in this darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. There is no one like our God. There is no one like our God. And greater things.
Amen. You may be seated. We have come to worship a God of this city and of all cities, of all people and of all nations. And so today is really a day as much about our community as it is about installing Jeff as the pastor or about our church in particular. And so we begin with a prayer for our community, which reflects Jeff Hart, Jeff's heart for La Cunada Presbyterian Church to be a church for the community. So let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we recognize that you are a God of every tribe and tongue and people and nation around the world. And so we are mindful uh, that we live in a small place and are located in a small place, La Cunada Presbyterian Church, that has a bigger call into your kingdom. We are mindful that we are just outside Los Angeles where there are many who are hurting, homeless living on the street, people just trying to get by. And so God, we pray that you would guide us into partnership and relationship with them. Help us be Christ's hands and feet to a community that is hurting in this greater Los Angeles area. God, we recognize your presence everywhere, but we know that people don't always see that presence. And so we pray that you would be working in each one of their lives in these households, in our vicinity, and in the vicinity of greater Los Angeles to turn people toward you, draw people into a relationship with you. Use not just our church, but every church that exists in this region, in this region to make your name known. God, help us to discover our place in that much greater purpose, we pray. God, you have placed us all here in these foothill communities, to work, to live, to go to school, God, to serve and to worship. So God, I pray that you would be with us as we go about our daily lives so that we can reflect your grace and love to those we encounter in the banks, at the grocery store, at school, and in our neighborhoods. God, may we be known as a community that loves you and tangibly shows that love to others. So God, be with us as we go about our lives. And Lord, because we do want to follow you as your disciples, we know that this means we will be led to reaching out into the world. We know that because you so loved the world that you sent Jesus into the world to serve the world with grace, mercy, salvation, and healing. And Lord, our world needs all of those gifts. As we hear of famines, floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, volcanoes, we know that the created world groans mightily awaiting its ultimate reconciliation and renewal in Christ's ultimate redemption. And then the creaturely world of human nature continues to convulse with the trauma of terror, torture, trafficking, and threats of nuclear war. So God, may this call and installation of Jeff to this pastoral leadership role into our church be then again a mutual call for all of us to partner with others and maybe even go ourselves into all the earth with the good news of your gifts and goodness in Christ as a countercultural demonstration of the sacrificial love and compassion of Christ until he comes again. For we do ask all of this in the name and for the sake of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, my name's Andy. I have known Jeff since I was in junior high, and he was my high school, he was the cool high school student who was the Bible study leader at First Presbyterian Church in Boulder. So I have some stories to tell as well. <laughs> However, Jeff has asked me to do something different, uh, to sketch out a theology of sentness, which is an interesting thing to do at an installation service, because when you think about the word installing, uh, you often think about fixing something into place. We joked at church this morning about how we install carpets, software, and pastors. 
But the other thing about installing something is that uh, it seems in some ways like the opposite of sending. You don't install a letter in the mail. You send a letter in the mail. And yet, I think as we'll see, what we're doing as we install Jeff this morning is actually situating him in a posture of continual sending. This is actually what God does with all of his people. And the first place that we see this kind of installation service comes in John chapter 20, where we read in verse 19 that on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, which just so happened to be the first day of a whole new world in which Jesus had been resurrected from the dead, the disciples were behind locked doors and Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and, said, and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And so in this passage, we have these first disciples being installed into this role of apostles or sent ones and what a thing it must have been to hear from the lips of Jesus as the father sent me so I am sending you because he was sending them with hands that had been scarred from his crucifixion and he was sending them uh, from the empty tomb from which he had just been risen but with those scarred hands that must have been so clear to the disciples that to be sent as Jesus was sent by the Father is to be sent on a way of descent, a way of self-emptying and sacrifice, of being oriented towards other people, of being sent into the world for the sake of the world. This is what God has been doing ever since he sent Abram and Sarah to a land that they did not know same God and Father who sent his son Jesus and then sends his son's followers in the power of his own spirit. So these disciples and these disciples are sent by the risen Jesus in the love of the Father and in the power of the Spirit. And so any theology of sentness begins with a Trinitarian texture. It's rooted in the Trinity and in God's love in who God is. So we participate in this, uh, in this relationship with God by being sent, even as he is ascending God, who sends his son and his people into the world for the sake of the world. This sending is also, I think, topographical, by which I mean we are sent to a particular place. We're not just launched into the stratosphere with the message of the gospel. But just as Jesus came from the throne of heaven to the streets of Palestine, so each of us are sent into a particular place with particular people and particular parks and particular places where God is calling us to be his representatives. So Jeff is sent from all kinds of places in his life, but he is sent here and he is sent with a posture of openness to the people who are here, the places that are here, to learn what God is doing in this place and in this time, and to be open as well to the work that God will be doing in him and in all of you. Because a theology of sentness needs to be rooted in the Trinity, it needs to be rooted in a particular place, but it also needs to be rooted in community. Because these are second person plural yous here, where Jesus says, as the Father sent me, so I send, send you. He's talking to a community of people. He's breathing his spirit on them all. So when Jesus sends his disciples as apostles, he doesn't just pick the smartest one of them all who's written a dissertation on the atonement in Hans Urs von Balthasar. But he sends us together in community to be a people of God for the world that God loved and came to save. So it's a real honor and privilege to be here, to be sending you, Jeff, so that you, Jeff, can be sending you 
La Cañada Presbyterian Church into this world in the love of the Father, by the command of the risen Son, and in the power of the Spirit for the sake of the world. So we have some people here who are going to send, Jesus, send Jeff from the places where Jesus has sent him. So I'd like to invite them to come forward and stand up here with me. And Jeff, I'm going to begin by sending you from the Salida Boulder Pastors Conference. We want to send you here for a number of reasons and in a number of ways. We want to send you here to embrace obscurity. We want to send you here to learn to love these skies you're under, this place where God has put you. We want to send you to behold the beauty of Jesus, to be small so that he can be large and magnified in your life and in the world. And we want to send you here to love and pastor these people as you have loved and pastored us. On behalf of Fremont Presbyterian Church of Sacramento, we send you Jeff to stretch caution tape across the pews. That's be hard. <laughs> to spread yards of sand on the floor, to roll trash cans filled with discarded Christmas wrapping paper out onto the stage. We send you to share homebrew and queso and chips and smoke brisket and brats. We send you to commit to women's retreats and man nights and Friday mornings, question two. We send you to tell you, we, we send you to tell of God in the chaos, spiritual formation of first supper and of nooks and crannies. We send you to hope in Christ alone, to stand in Christ alone, to live in Christ alone. We send you to baptize our families, marry our loved ones, and remind us, remind us of the nearness of Jesus when we feel our loved ones, love, when we feel our loved ones are taken too soon. We at Fremont send you because we fully know the meaning of go because of January 27th, 2008, because of Isaiah 30, 21. Jeff, and all the friendships you forge, and all the sermons you preach, and all the life that you share, we send you to point us to Jesus so that we may, so that we may follow him too. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Hansen. I'm one of Jeff's many friends in Boulder and one of the pastors at First Presbyterian Church in Boulder, Colorado. Anytime we send someone anywhere, it's because we believe they have some unique capability, gift, or strength to offer. And whenever you call someone, it's for that exact same reason. And I wanna tell you, at some point, you will discover the lie of that assumption. The only thing we have to offer is Jesus Christ himself. So let me just send you with this brief little reminder from 1 Corinthians. This is what Paul says, the one who probably was one of the, the greatest sent ones and called ones we have at least in the New Testament. And he said, and so it is with me, brothers and sisters. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's. Jeff, we send you to rely on the Holy Spirit as you step into this new ministry. Hi there, I'm John from Fort Collins, where Jeff was last serving. We had you only for a small period of time, but it was amazing. Um, we love you, and you, you shared that love you had for our community, and we send you to uh, release that love upon the community of La Cañada, Flint Ridge that the first thing you brought to us, and we're sitting in conference rooms discussing what this is going to be and how God shows up is joy. 
just joy and the joy is ever present whether you're talking about the brown haired girl you met on a raft trip or you're talking about those broncos and we're not supposed to tell them the score if anyone knows for a while um the joy you have it's not able to be contained that it's contagious it spreads throughout so with love and joy we send you from fort collins I'm Gary. I'm Gary. <laughs> he always says Gary one to me. He wants me to say two to him. I would prefer from here it be Gary Senior and Gary Junior. Junior. <laughs> <laughs> and we want to say that we are so thankful that God did not send another Gary. <laughs> so will you pray with us? We remember the words of the prophet Isaiah. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. With confident trust, O God, that this call has come to Jeff from you through this congregation. We thank you for this call and for bringing Jeff to this people, in this place, in this time. And God, we know the importance of a shepherd for a congregation. And those wonderful words of Jesus that I am the good shepherd, I know my own and they know me. May Jeff be strengthened, blessed continually, as he shepherds this congregation, continuing that shepherding ministry of our Savior and our Lord. And God, from the very beginning of the church, we know the importance of the preaching and teaching well. So the Apostle Paul encouraged the early church, let the, those who lead rule well, and let them be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. We thank you, God, for the gifts of preaching and teaching that you have bestowed upon Jeff. May he be faithful as he enables these people to interpret and apply the Word of God written to their lives individually and collectively throughout the world. And God, as wonderful as is the calling, as always, it shall be filled with challenges. And so we pray for the Spirit to come upon, to fill. Lord, again, the Apostle Paul recognized the importance of that spirit and he wrote that I pray that according to the richness of his glory that God will grant you to be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith as you are rooted and grounded in love. And may your servant Jeff, O oh God, be strengthened and renewed daily and continually by the indwelling presence and power of your Holy Spirit as he faithfully leads these people. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.
Thank you so much, choir. My name is Jane Filk, and I'm also here from First Press Boulder, and uh, I'm so glad to be here with you today. I get to uh, share a charge with Jeff uh, this afternoon. But first, I just want to tell you that my relationship with Jeff got off to a very awkward start, and I actually um, met him when I was wearing pajamas for the first time. <laughs> I had heard that this great family had moved to Boulder and I had met Heather and I loved her and I had her phone number so I sent him a text message and invited Heather and Jeff over for dinner. Only without knowing it, I had invited them a week earlier than I had intended and it was a pretty chaotic season of my life and it happened to be one of those Saturdays where I actually never got dressed and never dressed my kids and every surface of my house was just covered with toys and laundry you name it it was just out everywhere and i was pretty uh, aware of my disheveledness at the time but i heard the doorbell ring at five o'clock and not thinking anything of it assuming it was probably some kids from the neighborhood i opened the door in my pajamas and there was Jeff and Heather with a beautiful salad dressed like very normal people who were going to dinner on a Saturday night and I had never seen Jeff before this moment and I certainly did not want to invite him into my house but there we were piecing together that this text I had sent said this Saturday and not next Saturday and we had three little kids running circles around us and it was just a mess everywhere. And what I love so much about this moment is that as soon as Jeff and Heather really crossed into the threshold of all that was our life, Jeff looked right at me when I did not want anybody to see me. And he said, you know what this means, don't you? It means that we are going to be really good friends. <laughs> And I just cannot think of anything kinder or more gracious or better that anybody could have said in that moment. It was just grace upon grace. And Jeff, on that day, God entrusted me to you and me to you as a dear friend. And my life and my ministry and my faith are so much more filled with grace and kindness and joy because I know you and I'm so thankful. And I'm honored to share this word as you are installed really as an under shepherd and as a pastor of this people, people that God loves so much. You are dearly beloved people by Jeff and by God. And I love this passage that Jeff chose. It's John 21, 15 to 19. And it's really a vital conversation. I know that has been a theme for you, these vital conversations that Jesus had with Peter, calling him back to himself and into ministry. So let me read it for us. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. So similar to the passage that Jeff preached this morning. And I think what is suggested here that the single most important question that a disciple and certainly a shepherd of God's people can be asked is this, do you love Jesus? You might remember that Peter, even with his earnest desire to stand with Jesus, he denied him three times at Jesus' greatest time of need. But here Jesus graciously gives Peter an opportunity to reaffirm his love for him as he calls him, as he sends him into ministry. And Peter in his renewed humility here, very aware that he's a sinner as we heard this morning. When Jesus asked Peter if he loves him more than the other disciples love Jesus, something that Peter previously boasted, he simply says, Lord, you know you know all things. 
And what I imagine that Peter really is saying here is, I used to think I knew better than the others, and I used to think that I loved better than the others, but here is what I now know. This is what I have to bring to you, my Lord. You know all things, and you know that I love you, and that is all that I've got. And what is so significant here is that this amazing charge from Jesus for Peter to lovingly care for his people is not because of of Peter's unwavering character. It's because of Jesus, as we have heard over and over again. It's because Jesus sent him and called him to do it. And that is true for you, Jeff. This call to serve as a pastor as much as we love you, it's really not about you or your character or your abilities or your proficiency. It's about Jesus and his church and his kingdom and because of his call on your life. And the best way I've heard the work of feeding Jesus' lambs and caring for his sheep is simply to say this, that God is asking you to take very, very good care of the people that he has brought to you and to whom you have been sent. And in fact, as a pastor, one of the primary ways that you are invited to demonstrate that you love Jesus is to love the people that he has sent you to and to love the people that he brings to you, to nurture the littlest lambs and to feed all the sheep the best food, the word of God, and to teach them to feed themselves on the word of God, to prepare them to be one of Christ's people in the world as is all over your church, I love that, and to recover the wandering ones and to care for the sick. You have been tasked with something that is so important to Jesus, to take really, really good care of his people. And Andy, we heard him say this too, that. Though this isn't about you, in the goodness of God, in the intimate way that Jesus knows and sends each one of us to the particular people he brings into his life, into our lives, Jesus has called you at this particular time in history to this particular people, to this particular place. And that is an amazing ministry. And so it's not about you, and yet you are the one that God has sent. So in so many ways, Jeff, this passage is an affirmation to keep doing what you are doing and what you really love to do and do so well, what you have already done for me and for so many of us, to love Jesus with as much surrender and joy as you can, and to take really good care of the people that God brings to you to be their shepherd. But I do want to share this warning that Gary Sr. and Gary Jr. just prayed for you. That this discipleship, discipleship of all kinds, and particularly the call to be a pastor and to be a shepherd of God's flock does entail suffering and danger, even giving up your own life. As was the case for Peter, Jesus is referring to his martyrdom here. What's so amazing to me in this moment is that in his grace, Jesus includes this word about suffering So that when it came for Peter and when suffering and challenges come for you, you will not be tempted to ask, is this payback for my denial? Is this suffering happening to me or to my family now because I once turned away from Jesus or because I didn't love as well as I could have? Instead, Jesus wants Peter and you to know from the very, very beginning that giving up your life is part of this call that there will be suffering. And so Jesus offered this word from the very beginning so that you won't be thrown off course by it. Instead of being surprised by suffering, Jesus says, follow me. Follow me in the valley of the shadow of death and follow me in green pastures. Follow me when you are beside quiet waters and follow me when you are in the presence of your enemies. The most important question you will be asked as a pastor is do you love Jesus. And the most important thing that you can do as a pastor is to follow Jesus wherever he leads you. I brought you a simple gift and it's just a really rugged kneeling bench for prayer. It's made by one of our mutual friends, Father Anthony, who was in our Fuller Micah group. And I want you to have this. You are about to kneel to be prayed over, to be sent into this position. And I'm sure you heard it said that the best and healthiest church leadership is simply an exercise in downward mobility, the way of Jesus who took on the nature of a servant. So I give it to you to remind you of this call to love Jesus, 
to serve and take care very well of the people he sent you and to follow him wherever he would send you. I love you and I'm so grateful for you. God bless you. I want to add my own delight and gratitude and honor in being here. Jeff, thank you very much for the privilege of being here. It's been wonderful to be a friend and a colleague to you and to be uh, also a reader of your dissertation, this masterpiece that others have referred to, and the remarkable challenge that it was in the process to, to bring together some of the most challenging ideas that probably there are in Christian theology. And it's been the source of inspiration to me to think about a person with gifts like that serving as a pastor. Too commonly, it's thought to be something that's incompatible with pastoral ministry, but in your case, the two things, it seems to me, come very deeply together, and I'm very, very grateful for that. You're called to be a pastor theologian. You've already been that, you will be that, and you do it not in abstraction, but really in the way that you lead and in the kind of life that we've already been admonishing to you and ourselves to remember. I love worship in real time and in real spaces. Yeah, just have to remember I was a pastor in Berkeley for almost 30 years. This is just like really great. <laughs> really, really great. <clears throat> the culmination of the Gospel of Matthew uh, comes toward the very end of the text. When we've seen, of course, the long, surprising, unfolding ministry of Jesus that is a ministry that in some ways is exactly what was anticipated, but primarily is exactly uh, the surprise that God gave in Jesus in a way that was not at all anticipated. And after his death and after his resurrection and after his resurrection appearances, as his ministry is literally coming to a close and his earthly days are finishing after his resurrection appearances. Jesus is now, in the way it's represented in the Gospel of Matthew, coming to the very close of his commission. And the high point of mission that is often talked about is the set of verses that come at the very end of the text. The usual focus lies here at verse 18. And Jesus came and says to his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. It would be worth a long set of reflections to go into detail about what I think Jesus' call to mission means in these verses. But it certainly distills a deep sense that what we're called to, above all, is to make followers. Jane has wonderfully captured that, both in your own life and in the ministry that you will share together, the mission that is before all of us. And a service like this is a service that gives us an opportunity to remember your vocation and our vocation. In a real world with distractions and sounds and noises and movement, in competing voices, in competing messages, in competing claims of reality. To be a person who tries to make disciples is to say, let this be the center point of reality, the thing on which everything else takes its cue. And it's the reality of who God is and who God has revealed himself to be in Jesus Christ. And if you give people that instruction and coach and, and, and the encouragement and nourishment to go down that road as faithful followers, then you're giving people the very keys to the road of life itself, into reality. This is one of the things that makes the Christian gospel so captivating. When it stops being a charade of religious form and actually suddenly reality cracks open and you realize that the whole of reality itself is the heart and purpose of God and not the fiction and fantasy of our own making, but really the purposes of God who has created and made and sustained and formed us and called us into the most profound kind of communion and the most humble and remarkable and mysterious thing that we belong in Christ to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and in the communion of saints for the glory of God's eternal purposes. To be agents ourselves, as this call suggests, to be agents of that message. An economy that none of us could have imagined nor would have suggested but at the very heart of God's design. And the hope 
as he says at the very end, is remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now the part that comes just before that, I think, is even more remarkable. Given the weight of this extraordinary vocation to be God's people in mission. The weight of it really would be overwhelming. It has often been overwhelming. It has literally crushed earnest believers because I think they miss understanding what happens in the two verses just before this. The text says simply, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Matthew has made a great deal throughout the whole of the text in the repetition of the word 12. It was really a, a kind of formulaic anticipation of a new people of Israel, a new sense of God's establishment of the 12 disciples who would be the 12 anticipation of the 12 peoples that would somehow come into reality as the diverse people of God that would bring God's purposes to their fulfillment. But now, now we come to the very end, the climax of this great moment, and the text just simply says, now Jesus gathered with the 11. See, it just turned out that it didn't actually unfold the way that the text had set us up to anticipate. We might have thought it was going to be the perfect number, but no, it's just 12 that we're starting, and then just 11 that are gathering. Just a mere 11. The mission that's before the church never has a full complement of those that could have been invited. And it doesn't depend on the 12. It's given to the 11. And then, what's even more dramatic to me, is that after that, the text simply says, and when Jesus saw these 11, not 12, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And the text is even a little more complicated than that. It could be read almost like, and then some worshiped and doubted. So it was to 11 believer doubters that Jesus gave the weight of carrying forth the kingdom of God. I can't think of better news than those two verses. The reason we have the mission of God in the world is not that Jesus doesn't have an extraordinary mission or that it's God's mysterious purpose in some way to use us. But the encouragement lies in those two verses, 16 and 17, that it's just 11 believer doubters that Jesus entrusts the most important news in all the world. So as we are reminded today, again, of the significance of the mission, the urgency, the compelling urgency of a world that is broken and confused and divided in a world of hatred and vengeance, of poverty and injustice, of suffering and warfare and racism and hunger and disease and disaster, in a world nearby and far away, when there are people without hope and without God in the world, we are entrusted to be the bearers of that good news that there is a God who sees and knows and loves and wants us to be an embodiment of the reality of the kingdom of God that is before us. And we get to do it as the 11 that we will only ever be. Believer doubters, not true believers only. And therefore, we can together hear this call, receive it as good news, and carry it in grace and hope. Because, as Jesus himself says at the end, finally, I will be with you always, even to the close of the age. The mission that has been given to the Lacanada Presbyterian Church is urgently needed. It is a mission that's meant to change Lacanada, to help contribute to the change of a wider community and region and beyond even that the United States and beyond even that in the world because that's God's disseminating vision but the great joy is that we get to carry it as the people that we really are may you boldly honestly joyfully carry the mission of Christ in all that you are and all that you seek to do to the glory of Jesus Christ amen Uh, Reverend Hofmeyer, please come to the front to join the constitutional questions.
Uh, you are to stand in front of your congregation and to answer uh, the following questions. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledging Him Lord of all and Head of the Church, and through Him, believe in one God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the Church Universal and God's Word to you? I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our Church as authentic and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? I do and I will. Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? I do. Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? I will. Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? I will. Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and the purity of the church? I do so promise. Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? With God's help, I will. Will you be a faithful teaching elder, proclaiming the good news in word and sacrament, teaching faith and caring for people? I will. Uh, will you be active in government and discipline, serving the uh, councils of the church and in your ministry? Will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? I will. Uh, since you have answered the questions in affirmative, uh, Presbytery will install uh, with prayer and laying of hands. Uh, I'll invite uh, for the prayer of installation uh, Reverend Graham Baird and Guinea Frederick. And I also invite uh, the pastors from the Presbytery of the San Fernando Presbytery who want to join. Please come to the uh, front. Thank you, Thank you so much. I'm also going to ask Eleanor and Anderson, who are pastor's kids, and I know something about what it feels like to be that, to come down, and Heather, to have hands laid upon you, and the 11 who are gathered here, elders and pastors. Father in heaven, this is not a day that we chose. This is the day that you ordained many years ago, long before Jeff was born. You planned these things. We ask, Lord, on this day, on this 500th anniversary of Luther, that we would give you our prayers and let you do the worrying we ask that by some power that is not of our own, but of the Holy Spirit, that you would lay hands on Jeff and Heather and Eleanor and Anderson on their shoulders and in their hearts, and let them know how much you love them and will always watch over them. Loving and gracious God, what a what a wonderful moment in time this is. We praise you, we thank you, we stand in absolute awe of how you've brought us all to this holy, holy moment. In the service today, it's clear that you have been gifting and growing Jeff for many, many years, preparing him to serve you now here at LCPC. 
and I thank you that he's responding to your call. God, I just keep imagining you smiling, this big, broad smile right now, as you are taking the fabric of Jeff's life and the fabric of LCPC's life and weaving us together for your holy purposes. In this special time of installation, baptize Jeff into your service. I pray, Lord, that you will just pour out your Holy Spirit upon him abundantly and lavishly. Pour yourself out upon him and into him and through him in this day and in all the days to come. May you enable Jeff to lead with your love, with your strength, with your vision. And under his leadership, may we be a church family that just overflows with love and compassion. May we always, always have a spirit of unity as we are united in you, Jesus. And now, Lord, to you who is, immeasurably, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, to you be glory and honor and praise in this day. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray these things. Amen. And now let's stand and sing in Christ alone after this important thing. Okay, uh, where is uh, Reverend Jeff Hofmeyer? Please come to the front again. Yes, please uh, stand here. Uh, Reverend Jeff Hofmeyer, you are now an installed teaching elder in the Church of Jesus Christ. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father uh, through Him. Amen. 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 Thank you. Not me, uh, to him. <laughs> On behalf of the Preparatory of San Fernando, I sincerely welcome you into the Ministry of the Word and Sacrament. Congratulations. You all can be seated. We have a surprise for Jeff that's not in the bulletin. But, Jeff, I just wanted to say, on behalf of the PNC, we could not be happier for this day. <laughs> Um, and I think officially the PNC is now officially adjourned. We're yeah, here. you're done. Um, but I wanted to say, too, on behalf of LCPC, we are over the moon excited to have you as our senior pastor. And so we have a gift for you, and I'd like you to open it right now. Um, and this gift is to commemorate not just this special day, but also the beginning of your ministry here. And I'm going to explain it once you, uh, once you open it. This is a stole. Here, put it around your neck so everybody can see it. You are not a conventional Presbyterian pastor, and so we didn't want to just get you any old conventional stole. So we actually had this handcrafted, especially for you, with symbols on it that we hope will be really meaningful to you and, um, yes, very meaningful to you. So the first one is a Celtic cross down here on the, that side because we know that your Scottish heritage is really important to you and the symbolism of that cross. Also, along the bottom are mountains. We know you're a Colorado boy and you love Colorado mountains, uh, but we hope that you will equally love California mountains before too long. And also, as the psalmist David wrote, when I lift my eyes to the hills, where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord. So I hope when you're driving down Foothill Boulevard and you lift your eyes to the hills that your help indeed will come from the Lord. Uh, on the right here is a fishing rod because you love fly fishing, nice. but you've already been talking to us about being fishers of men. Yes. And on the right is a shepherd's staff. I don't know, probably many of you don't realize it was almost a year ago to this day that Jeff first contacted the PNC and we started a conversation that led now to this moment in time. And at the top of that letter was Psalm 78, 
where it said, uh, David, I wrote it down here, David shepherded them with integrity of heart, with skillful hands he led them. And you told us that that was a guiding prayer for you, and um, then that it was your magnetic north. So I hope that that continues Thank to you. be that. So when you wear it, I hope you feel loved and embraced by us. Thank so. you, Jenny. Thank you. So Jeff, I too have something for you. It's this service is very much has a piece of ceremony and tradition, and I understand from your brother that there is a Hofmeyer tradition, and so it is my duty to give this to you. And there's a story behind this. I think it's a cow pencil sharpener. So you all can ask Jeff later about that story. <laughs> Well, that's an awkward way to, win a, to end a worship service. <laughs> My brother and I have been trading this cow for probably 30 years. It's gone back and forth at significant occasions when we were married, the birth of our children, and this is now a significant occasion as well. Well done, Brian, and thank you. <laughs> now I think we're going to stand and sing in Christ alone. closing piping hymn from my good friend Graham Baird. So let me ask you to take a seat because you're going to want to enjoy those few moments. I want to offer just a few words of gratitude uh, before this worship service ends and before I offer a benediction. Uh, I offered many words in this bulletin. I'm not going to go through all of those, but I just want to very quickly say thank you to my installation commission 
who laid hands on me and prayed for me. So too, thank you to the Presbytery of San Fernando. Thank you to the many uh, friends and pastors and elders who were a part of this worship service. Thank you to the staff and session and deacons of this church who are willing to have an outdoor worship service and all of the work that in, that entailed. Thank you to this congregation for your willingness and invitation for me to be your senior pastor and for the prayers that you have offered. I am so, so very honored. And my deepest gratitude to my wife Heather and my children Eleanor and Anderson for their support and love and prayers. And now church, receive this benediction in the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, may we be the church that exists for others. May we exist for the people who are underneath us on the 210 freeway as we speak. May we exist for others, serve them, and share this life-changing gospel with them to the glory of God who is Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, now is when we have brownies and lemonade. Enjoy. <laughs>